Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today's episode welcomes an entrepreneur who generally believes one person's trash is another person's treasure by turning recyclable items into a profitable business, which got me thinking about recycling. What is recycling? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? And yes, I'm talking about that type of recycling. The process of collecting and processing materials that would otherwise be thrown away as trash and turning them into products. For those listening that did not grow in the United States, the slogan may be new. Growing up in the U.S., many kids heard this three-word slogan, reuse, reduce, and recycle. It is debatable exactly when the slogan was created, but the origins are often traced back to the first National Earth Day on April 22, 1970, which is the exact same year the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, was formed. The goal was to reduce overall waste footprint, reuse versus discarding items, and recycle items to turn them back into raw materials that we used again to manufacture new products or items. Why is this important? It protects our ecosystem and wildlife by lessening the disruption of the natural world, such as cutting down fewer trees. It is the conservation of natural resources. When we don't recycle plastic, it can take up a lot of solid waste and can take centuries to break down. Fun fact, most plastic comes from fossil fuel hydrocarbons. More recyclable metal means less extracted new metal, also reducing the need to harvest new materials. Additionally, using recycled materials requires less energy than making new raw materials. For example, recycling one glass bottle saves enough power to light a 100-watt light bulb for four hours, which in turn saves money. Many states in the U.S. will provide deposits back on certain aluminum items, mostly beverages such as soda, beer, and bottled water, to name a few. So again, for those folks that are listening outside the United States, which I'm very shocked to say there are many, the deposit return gives back the deposit amount spent on that can. In Oregon, the deposit is 10 cents per can. However, some grocery stores will even go further and will provide an additional 2 cents per bottle if instead of taking the cash, the depositor decides to take a credit at the local grocery store to purchase from that store again. Example, Fred Myers in Oregon will give depositors 12 cents per return instead of the typical 10 cents deposit if the depositor takes the return as a credit to purchase at a Fred Myers grocery store in the future. It is a phenomenal way to get the depositor to return to the store for a purchase. But the most important aspect is climate change, and that is why the entrepreneur should care. Let us remove the blinders that we have slid over our eyes for the past few years from various news stations, commenters, social media sites, memes, or what have you. Do not listen to anyone. Do not even listen to me right now. But look around. What is happening in our world? Remember, we are part of a global economy. What is happening to our globe is important to understand as it will affect anything an entrepreneur touches. Speaking from experience, I would prefer not to spend my time worrying about family during one of the worst fires our state has ever seen, and then only months later that fearsome worry change to the worst ice storm our state has ever seen. As I constantly state throughout this podcast, the first step of being an entrepreneur is identifying the problem. The richest man in the world is making electric cars. Look at climate change as a business opportunity like Fred Meyer's grocery store is doing. Who can create carbon negative furniture? Who can tap into the untapped solutions hidden to the tropical forest? Who can create something that is just as efficient, if not more efficient, that has a lesser impact on our climate? We are a globe of community entrepreneurs. This world and everything that is in it was built from an entrepreneur. And I, for one, cannot wait to see what the global community of entrepreneurs creates next, together. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. and costumes and has started a 
Cosmetic Company featuring 100% rescued and reused home decor. From making kids feel one of a kind on Sesame Street to making one of a kind art, please welcome the owner of Bunny Milkshake Concoctions, Vanessa Gillis. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am here with the owner of Bunny Milkshake. Very unique name. Do you guys actually make milkshakes? Uh, well, I do do sort of make little tabletop milkshakes. Okay, Vanessa Gillis, let's let's get into this uh, really, really cool uh, what you're doing. I've been checking out your uh, website, but first, before we kind of get into the bunny milkshake, let's mm-hmm. introduce the world to Vanessa. Who is Vanessa? Oh, man. Uh, well, I'm a mom. Uh, I'm a East Coaster living in Portland. I've been here for 10 years, but still an East Coaster. Uh <laughs> Uh, I don't know. You know, I went to school in the East Coast. I grew up there. I went to RISD. I lived in New York for 10 years, and now I'm a mom in Portland making recycled, upcycled art. But you didn't start making... Let's let's talk about what did you do before you uh, did the recycling art? Like right out of school? Yeah. Uh, my first job actually out of school was at the Christmas Windows uh, in New York, Um I was doing the posing of the animatronic people. Um, And then I, well, I guess, you know, I had interned before that, though, actually at Sesame at Muppets, uh, the Muppet workshop on uh, Bear in the Big Blue House. I was like doing all the little cutting of the fur and all that stuff. And then I went to Sesame Street. I mean, I freelanced kind of all over the place. So I did Sesame Street and... Bear in the Big Blue House and Blues Room. And the longest stint I had was at Avenue Q. So it was all this kind of puppets. I went from like props and costumes to puppets to kind of like a mishmash of all of that. And then, uh, yeah, and then I was at Avenue Q for a really long time. And then I decided I was just like over puppets, like so bored. So um, I went on to textiles for like this little blip, like right when the... um, right when everyone was getting laid off. So it was like 2008. So I would kind of get hired and then laid off and then hired, then laid off. And then I went back to puppets um, for like my last year. And I worked at uh, Puppet Heap, which is in New Jersey, which was kind of where the Muppets went. Because the Muppets, when I joined, was like getting all split into pieces. It was getting sold. Like Disney had some, Children's Television Workshop. It was just kind of all over the place. So a lot of the core people kind of made their own businesses. So I ended up at one of those working for Sesame Street and the Muppets kind of right before I moved here. So, so what exactly were you doing with puppets? Were you at the uh, hand or were you actually no, creating the puppet? I'm not a performer. I definitely am a behind the scenes girl. I do not like to be in front of the camera. It's not my favorite. So um, I make puppets, the costumes for puppets, the props for puppets. I mean, it's funny because I went to school and I graduated in 2001 for industrial design. And so we were like one of the last classes that was still doing it more by hand like the class below us had those shiny colored mac and we didn't have those like we were literally the last class so everything (laughs) was like you know if you're doing we didn't have 3d printers so if you were going to make something for a project you would sculpt it and it was supposed to look real so that kind of led naturally into this kind of props thing and then that kind of led into the puppet thing and then um yeah so i basically when i used to freelance i freelance my shtick was I could make anything. And if I can't make it, I know someone who can make that, you know, I can always get anything done. That was always my thing. So, uh, but I, I'd say fabric and kind of, I don't know, I figured out my scale is like kind of, you know, puppet sized, you know, nothing too big. Cause I started off in, in apparel design in school and it was just the wrong scale and the wrong industry. And I think a lot of it's just like figuring out what scale you want to work at. Now, now for the listeners, what when you're when you're saying scale, kind of describe that. It's like how big. It's like some people like to work miniatures, right? Like I came here and worked at Leica for a bit, and that's miniatures and the teeniest things, and that's like emotionally like too small for me. And then people <laughs> size things. When I had to do costumes for real people, it was like that's too big. So it's like you know, it's like three bears, and so kind of this middle ground, like you know, two to three feet is the zone I want to be working in for basically everything. You know, it's when things get too small, I just 
it's just, it just stresses me out. So. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. It's just just me, maybe. I like it. Now, so let's let's give the folks at home a little bit of understanding. What is Bunny Milkshake and what does it do? Well, I make home decor and party things and basically whatever I think of. And I make it only out of reuse. So it's like um, whatever I find. It, I, and I've stopped caring about what it is. So I can put anything I want on whatever I want. Before I was kind of worried about things not being like classy enough or is this nice enough. And I'm like, no, if a ping pong ball like fits there, like put the ping pong ball like right there. So it's like wreaths and garlands and centerpieces and party favors and ornaments and who knows? Like, I never quite know. I started making chandeliers that don't light up, which then I was like, <laughs> is that a chandelier if it doesn't light up? I'm not sure. But um, yeah, just, just whatever. But things to decorate your house, one of a kind that's strictly just reuse, like nothing new. And did I also see earrings? Did you see earrings? I don't know. I, I can't remember. I think so. Although people have wanted to make earrings out of my ornaments. So that's been on the... The hmm list, oh, no. maybe. <laughs> but no, not recently. I mean, maybe back in the day I did. I feel like I've made so many things, but. Now, how would, how did your experience, you know, working with the Muppeteers and Sesame Street and all those other things kind of help kind of get you to this moment? Well, because you use like every kind of material and it's the same kind of thing where you, it's like, you don't know, you don't care what it's made out of. Like, you know, those, those things made out of, the puppets made completely out of a hat someone had, you know, like, and then they remake that puppet and they have to remake the hat. Like, it's like, it's, you just make things like gluing and sewing and how are you going to attach this metal bit to this fabric bit? Like, it's going to have to be a different way than last time because it has to move. I mean, my thing was always, it has to, everything had to be durable. Like it had to be usable. It had to hold up and it couldn't fall apart. So that's always kind of like how to make it strong and, and then also attach weird things to them. So. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Now, why did you decide to kind of pivot out of, you know, going through that kind of uh, structure of that job to being an independent entrepreneur? Well, it's the kids, you know, I've got two kids and um, there's a limited time. So I'm the stay at home person. And so, you know, I was dealing with like, one kid at home and then one kid's at school for three hours. Like, you know, you just have these little bits of time. And so, I mean, it all feels like kind of like it just sort of happened. You know, it started with a little crafting project. And then, you know, I applied to the garden home rec sale because I was like, I, I don't know, like I have all these bits. Maybe I can make something. And then they let me in and I had like three weeks to make <laughs> stuff. And I was like, that booth was very confusing for all people. But... <laughs> Like, they're like, is this for sale? I'm like, I don't know. Like, this maybe I, I don't know. But, <laughs> Are you going to offer me something for it? <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of. Like, just total chaos. Um, but it was, a, it's a timing. And then being stuck at home with the pandemic was like, what else can I do? And I'm the type that will go insane if I don't work. So it's like, it's not really an option for me to just, you know, so my house is a mess, but, you know, I'm working. So, <laughs> so how did, how did the business end up? Did it start during the pandemic? No, it started a little before that. Like I, it was, I think it was about, was it two Christmases before the pandemic was the one that I got into the garden home. And then I kind of built it slowly. You know, I'm like a, I'm like a thrift shopper. I love to gather, you know, you have the bins here, you yeah. have Goodwill outlet, which is like kind of the, like the cause of all this, I think, because <laughs> I would go there and I would see all these magical bits of things that had no more purpose and nobody wanted anymore. But they weren't going to go anywhere. Like, like just even empty wreaths, I, like which is what I would picked up the first time, but like a pile of empty wreaths. And I was like, oh, we'll craft with the kids. And um, But to me, it's just like tragic. So I started to gather up like the most special weird things I would find. And uh, But I don't know how I got off on this tangent, but. Uh, goodwill. We're talking oh, about yeah, Goodwill we got and the, the bins. Goodwill, the Goodwill bins, right, <laughs> which is its own world in itself. But that was kind of how it started. And so I'd, I had access to all this and I didn't have you don't have access to stuff like that in New York like you don't you don't have access to cheap things you don't have access to cheap supplies there's no way there's no way I could have done this in the city um with the space required and the just it wouldn't have happened because here there's like I used to say that Portland is where um like everything I've ever owned came to die 
because I like showed up here and in every thrift store, like everything I've ever owned is here. Like every doll I've ever had is in like (laughs) a vintage store in Hawthorne, you know, things that I would like pay 60 or $70 for on eBay is just, it's all here. And there's like 10 of them and I don't understand it, but it's, it's like a, it's very plentiful, the inexpensive, cool vintage and just craft stuff. Oh, and you know, I got to admit, I, uh, you know, I've been in New York, went to Syracuse at school over there and I never really thought about it, but yeah, there are no good wills out there. I mean, there's like a couple of sad, tragic ones, but you know, after all of this started, I did talk to a friend who says that there is a Goodwill bins in Jersey and she went and it was like a whole different experience because it was more about the fashion. Oh, Jersey. Oh yes. (laughs) Yes. And I did work in Jersey for a while. I've worked in a few places in Jersey. Um, but I, yeah, I have a fondness for Jersey. Now that I have some distance, I kind of miss it. Like <laughs> now that you have the distance. I'm like, oh, Jersey, I miss you. Oh, I miss. So, so um, you know, how did you financially, did you just start this kind of organically, just kind yeah. of grassroots it? Yeah, I mean, I just would just buy stuff. and It, became, it was like a hobby, and it was kind of like an excuse to buy more fun craft. Because, like, it's like everyone who likes to make things likes to buy things. I mean, that's, the like, one of the best parts is, like, people that go to Michael's, and they're like, yes. <laughs> but um so I just kind of would like because I would go there shopping for stuff for the kids and I would grab stuff for me so it's it's still very much kind of like that except now the shopping is like more part of my work day where I'm like oh I haven't been to the value village and like, <laughs> I better go check out the Easter and um it's interesting but yeah and so it's just been like that and it's in my house it's just I had a studio that was kind of my stay-at-home mom request was that I had a studio so when we bought the house like I have a room for me which is now spilling out into the living room it's everywhere (laughs) currently it's just everywhere so um, I'm getting a shed oh nice that's my big excitement not to work in but to just get everything out of my house into I'm I admit I'm yeah I'm looking for hopefully this summer to get a shed it's exciting yeah shed is it's gonna I'm just picturing these like rows of bins like it's just it sounds so soothing. Yeah, I, I'm actually now picturing the she shed commercials. Yeah, that, right? <laughs> but I don't want to work out there. It's like once you turn into a she shed, then it's like it's just it sounds cold. It sounds very like oh, how am I going to be warm and like yeah. damp? And like so, are you just going to primarily for storage? Yeah, just for storage. Okay. Yeah. Now, is this your first business? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I tried to start a bunny milkshake. Like the name I started, I'd say around 2009, maybe maybe 2009, and I was doing textiles. So I did a couple of big events like the Renegade, um, East Coast and West Coast, doing woven textiles because I was, you know, I also weave and um, trying to make housewares with that. I mean, the the hard part about all of this is like your hours. It's like it's like when you go from working at a place where you can bill your hours to not being able to bill your hours and people say, oh, like you figure out your prices by how many hours. And I'm like, that's not how this works yeah, at yeah. all. Like, no, then it would be like, you know, $6,000 yeah. please for this pencil <laughs> topper. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's, so true. it's so sad, but it's true. Cause it's like, you can't even calculate, especially if you have something like shopping involved. It's like, I don't know how long that, like, yeah, it's impossible yeah, that's a good to point. calculate. And your drive time and all, you're taking the miles and the gas and then you start, yeah. Yeah. And just like the sorting of like, that's part of it is I'd go and get all these supplies and I have to like sort them out to where they need to go so I can put them all together. And that that's a whole, that's a whole situation. Now you mentioned, you mentioned the name you've used yeah. it. Where, where did, where did bunny milkshake oh, come from? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I've always liked bunnies. So I had bunnies at the time. I've always kind of had bunnies. And then, um. I think it's just one of those things, you know, when I went to school, they talk a lot about branding if you're in industrial design. And so, you know, even if you don't have a product, you usually have a logo and a name and like, you know, you can just look like you have a business, even though there's nothing behind it, right? That they teach you that like, you know, you need to have this like strong face going forward. So, um, so it felt very important. So before I had anything, I just sat and brainstormed like what funky little names I could have, um, But then like it was hard because it was like bunny milkshake. And then so the second half of it is concoctions, which is like a really long word. (laughs) So I have this really long company name. Um, So when I go to make business cards, it's like just a kind of a mess. It's just so many words. But um, but nothing else sounded right. It's like bunny milkshake ink. Oh, that's boring. You know, now I think maybe I would have stuck with, you know, just bunny milkshake. So so the full name is actually bunny milkshake. Concoctions. concoctions yeah which they are concoctions so it's appropriate um but it's long it's yeah a long one. yeah 
Yeah, I'm, I'm realizing that the shades of entrepreneurship is one, very long. Yeah. And yeah. two, entrepreneur is actually really hard to spell. I, yeah, because <laughs> I, I typed it in and I kept switching the E. Yeah, the I get the E and the U like, mix it, up. Yeah. Which one? I was like, we'll just let the computer decide. Yeah, thank God for Google. Thank God. Now, what has been difficult about this business or starting this business? I think it's time. For me, it's just going to be time because of, I'm also parenting and... That's, I mean, you can fill, I could fill all my time with the parenting and with the yeah. housework and yep. the whatever. So it's like carving away the time and then making it feel important. I think, you know, when things transition from like a hobby to a business, it's like making it, making the time for it and make it valid, you know, because you're kind of like, well, you know, I guess I could, because the first thing that goes out the window is when a kid gets sick. Or like right now, the kids have all these days off for school for whatever reason. And <laughs> like it's making me nuts. And but it's like that's my schedule. So that's all. All of a sudden, those are two days I can't work this week, unless I pay someone or do something. But it feels different than if you go to a job or if you have set hours or something like that. So for me, my hours are complete chaos because I just squeeze in little, like little bits all over. You know, it just especially during the pandemic, it was like every twenty minutes I would get twenty minute work bursts two kids on computers, you know, and like hook them up to the next class and then go down. Like my glue gun was like always on. If it wasn't, I'd be so frustrated. I'm that's like, too ah. funny. And that, that's, I admit, you know, even with this podcast, as, as I was mentioning, I work a full-time, you know, job. Right, right. And so like right now it's a, Hey, let's, let's, let's do an interview during the kids nap time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then if they decide they're not going to nap that day, thank God for mom's home too. So I she's know. helping out, but yeah, it's, it's kind of plug and play. Well, yeah, I mean, the kid, like, coughs, and I'm like, no, no, like, not today. You can't <laughs> cough today. Like, I can't. You can't get sick. <laughs> no. Now, has there been anything easy about this process? I mean, for me, it's, like, the the work itself is easy. Like, I, I've i always had, like, a billion ideas. I, like, I never run out of ideas. So I can make, if, I, I feel like I just run out of the energy for it, but I can just make stuff. So for me, I just flow. Like, I can just keep making stuff until I pass out. Like, just, like, what's next, what's next, what's next? So I think that's the easy part for me is like just the making of it. Like it seems to fit for whatever reason, this wreath thing, which I've never had wreaths in my life. Um, it just fits. Like I can just you know, it kind of focuses my energy, like this circle format or something. Yeah. So why, why wreath and why recycle? What, how did the yeah. concept kind of. Well, when formulate? I was in school, I mean, I've always been obsessed with upcycling and reuse. And one of the reasons I didn't go into industrial design was because of the it was all about mass production. You know, we would, we would go visit a pen factory and I'm like, Oh my God, like so many pens, so many toothbrushes. Why are we doing? And they're like, redesign the pen. And I'm like, again, like, why, why are we doing this? You know? Cause it just creates so much garbage. And so, um, it, it stresses me. It's always stressed me out. It's always like been a problem. So, um, for me, it was important to, to not create more, more garbage. Like, more things people are going to toss. Like my hope is the things I make people will use again and again, you know, it's, they can use it every year. They can do something with it. And then I make them out of things that people use once like gift ties. And I love Hawaiian lays, like those cheap ones that people buy and like oh, yeah. pack at the dollar store. Yeah. Like, I use those so, so much. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, I mean, that part was important. And the wreath thing was just random. Like I literally had just picked up some little wreaths at the store at the Goodwill and brought them home, and I had found this little box. This like this little box is like my favorite thing now. It was like someone's collection of little tiny bits. It was vintage. It had kind of like fancy cursive. I envision there's like some fancy lady that had this, <laughs> and inside the box was all these little tiny pins and all these little plastic flowers and all these glittery bits. And you could tell this was like her little craft box. And so I pulled that out and I pulled these wreaths out and I started making wreaths for just fun one day. And that's still my favorite little box to dip into because I'm like, oh, just a little special thing. And, but it, yeah, it's just random. I mean, everything is pretty, it's kind of like it just sort of happened, I think. What motivates you? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't really know. I think, I think just the way my brain is, it's like the kind of dumping of ideas and designs all the time because they're always there. So for me to have an outlet for that and to just – especially like the time frame, I can just keep making one and then the next and then the next. Um, it's, it just, it's soothing, you know, and it's exciting. It's fun to watch people get excited about something that they're going to put in their house. And because some people get really excited and they're like, this is the one. And I'm like, Oh, yay. 
it was great, you know, and, and that's fun. That's motivating. Yeah. And you know, I, I got to admit, I've, I spent some time on the website looking at your page, looking at some of your products. They're super cool. They're super cute. Thanks. They're super creative. Give, give the audience a, at home kind of describe it verbally kind of what they're going to get. Cause it is going to be a wreath, but there's, yeah. but there's more than just wreaths. Cause you mentioned you had Christmas ornaments, which I think now I might've gotten confused is earrings. Well, those are what people want to put on their ears. So you're not, <laughs> you're not wrong. You're totally not wrong. Um, I use a lot of color. Um, I don't shy away from color, um, but just unique little things. Like I, I'm trying to think what I just, I mean, I just made one where I found a, a little yarn llama and I put it on with some kind of fancy yarn things that I've been gathering for probably two years. And then, you know, I, I try to hit every kind of aesthetic, but always a little wackadoodle. There's always some wackadoodle there. Some of them are kind of funny. Sometimes there's a little situation happening on there. Um, but just one of a kind, kind of unique, bright, sparkly things, I think. But, you know, I can do some darker things. On Halloween, <laughs> I try. I try. I did this one with crows, and I called it the Moira wreath. Oh, nice. You know, obviously Moira. Um, and that was very, it had lots of black. So, right. but so how, how, do you, how do you market yourself? How do you brand Bunny Milkshake? Hmm. Well... I, I just, I really just talk about the reuse factor and the colors and just, just kind of that, like, it's just kind of fun and good for the planet and hopefully makes you laugh or smile or something, you know? Yeah. I know me and you and I were actually, before this, uh, we started recording, we're talking about the good old social media, mm, Oh, right. our love hate relationship. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't think folks really at home understand, um, it's not easy to become social media famous no, <laughs> no. and, and, and the amount of work that actually goes on the back end um, is, is pretty a mass, right? It is. It is. It's like, there's like a baseline amount. I feel like I'm at the baseline of what I'm, I should be doing. Um, you know, I like try to post every day, but you know, for every post you need to take the photos and you need to fix the photos and you have to, you know, think of the comments and think of the hashtags. And the ha and yes. I, I feel like I'm always missing the hashtags. I feel like there's some brilliant hashtags that I just haven't yeah. discovered. Yeah. And for, so here's a little tip for the folks at home that are going through this plight of, you know, having to try to post something every other day or every day. A few things that I, I've been doing. Um, one, put all your hashtags on like a Word document so you copy and paste. Oh. <laughs> I, I did that. Just okay. copy and paste. Okay. So all my hashtags are on a Word doc, copy and paste. Now, what I also did is I actually went on Google and like, hey, what are the most famous hashtags for, you know, what 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 oh, yeah. gets the most draw? So nice. so the hashtags I'm using are actually, you know, ones that are commonly used as well. So that's one. Two, organically go and build relationships, you know, build yeah. and like comment on other folks' um, ideas, like their uh, posts. I share a lot of community posts on my Instagram. So if like there's a local event coming up, um, gallery go go anytime you know as we post something i tend to post or any of my past guests how important um has networking been for you and and kind of getting the business going it's definitely important i mean it, and i think it is for any business i think it's like the most important thing so it's getting yourself out there you know i do these shows i have a couple coming up like the night market and crafty wonderland i finally got into which took 400 years but um but it's like getting yourself in front of people to talk to them about it is I think the most important more than a lot of the social media, because you can't get a lot of the information on the social media. You know, you can kind of get a picture and a little thing, but I think that's the best way, you know, and Azure, she's great at the gallery. Oh yeah. She's awesome. Yeah. So and she's good at all that stuff. So yeah. she's helping me figure some of that out. Man, but, shout out to go gallery. Go, go. They're doing some amazing things. I am she just, the pieces of art that she'd be kind of, and, and I think to the, the community that she's creating, right? The, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. And she's so positive. Yes. Yeah. Now as a small business owner, yeah. what, what keeps you up at night? Oh, I don't know. Not too much. Well, the only thing that really stresses me out are deadlines. So, uh, that's really kind of it because there's, there's less pressure on my business for the money part of it. Like I need to make a certain amount of money, but it's not as high pressure, as it would be if I was in New York or somewhere else. So I can, I have room for some failure, which is relaxing because a lot of people don't, you know, I don't have people that have given me money that I have to pay back or, you know, any of that stuff. So there's that pressure is not on me. Otherwise I think that would drive me crazy. But for me, it's just these kind of production deadlines, like producing how much, cause I'd never know what people are going to buy and everything I make is different. And then 
you know, sometimes I have something that does so well at one sale and then just crickets at the next sale. And so you have to figure out what you need to bring. And then I've learned there's like a physical limitation to how much you can make yourself. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. Which I, which my brain will keep going, but, you know, eventually you do have to sleep. So. Makes sense. That's hard. I think that's hard. Has there ever been a moment of self-doubt? Oh, yeah, all the time. Like, what am I doing? You know, sometimes you're like, just put it all in bins and like go have a yard sale. Like, who knows, you know? Uh, yeah, oh, definitely. And one of the things that's funny is I use a lot of items on my wreaths that are very expensive or they were. Mm, and okay. so that's kind of hurts a little because I've done some resale to kind of, that's one thing I've done to kind of keep the money um, coming in for the business is like if I go to the bins or something, I'll pick up things I know I can resell on eBay or to consign, you know, like cool vintage stuff. Right, right. And I'll resell that and that helps me fund my business. But so I'll get things that I know or they'll still have the price tags on it. And I'll be like, this $60 ornament is going on a wreath that costs $68, you know? And it's, I try not to think about it like that. I try to think of every material as equal. Like it's all equal. It's all just stuff, no matter what, you know, like Lord and Taylor priced it at. It's like, it doesn't matter. But, but sometimes you're tempted to just be like, oh, if I just like nudge this over, over here, I could just sell it, you know? And, yeah. and it's, there's a line there where I try to figure out what's, what's what. And, and for the folks that are buying $60 Christmas ornaments, there are a lot of small businesses out there you can support with instead of buying a $60 Christmas you, ornament. And the, even, but even the craft supplies alone, like I couldn't do what I was doing if I had to buy new supplies. Like I will put on like 30 flowers and each flower had a price tag of $5 on it. And, you know, I just got it. Someone had donated it to Goodwill and then I bought it by weight, you know. Yeah. So that's something that, always makes me feel a little nutty is the volume of cost for someone else to do this. Like if someone's like, I want to do, I want to make wreaths. It's like they, they couldn't if, unless they charged like, you know, $600 for a wreath, which, you know, that would be fine, I guess, but hard so, to sell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what advice do you have for aspiring entrepreneurs or, or even thrifters? Cause you know, it's the kind of an area you seem to be in. What, what kind of advice you know, would you say, hey, these are the pitfalls to avoid? Well, I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't feel like I've had too many pitfalls. I feel like it's been pretty, it's like kind of just been a slow climb. Um, I think for thrifters, it's like, you know, leave some of it at the store unless you have somewhere to put it because you can just amass so much, especially in a place like Portland where there's so much that you can get. I know a lot of people that have amassed a great pile of thrift and they don't have anything to do with it. So I think, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's been pretty good. I haven't had too much, you know, well, I mean, you know, just get sleep, take a day off. That's like the best mm, advice yeah. because I do not take days off and that makes for exhaustion. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Rarely. Yeah. No, I don't. So, and I'm, I'm looking forward my next day off, I think is, um, May 1st. I, I was, it was kind of funny. I was yeah. thinking about like looking at the head of the calendar before you got here. I'm like, <laughs> okay, I got a, I got a presentation in Missouri. Then I got to come back and then I got fly out to Mexico and I come back and I got a presentation yeah. in Atlanta. Then I come back and then I got to go to a wedding in Missouri again. And then it's like, but on the addition to that, it's work plus podcasting plus yeah. writing a newsletter plus writing a blog plus it's like, it's oh, like your brain is going in 400 directions yeah. at once yep. and even with just my business it's like even trying to think because it's not just the making there's all these other things you have to do um that I've learned to try to make time for like I try to have everything that I'm going to make for a sale done three days before because I used to work right up till because then you still have to price everything you have to pack everything you have to have bags to give people you have to have price tags made like I make the price tags out of yeah. recycled paper you know it's like all that little stuff is also, and then you have to advertise on Instagram and it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of extra stuff when I would just prefer to do the making really. What, what would you say are some of the little things that surprise you that kind of arose? You're like, Oh, didn't think about that. I think it's the time stuff and just the, how much it takes, how much it takes other than making things. And you know, and the advice they always gave you at school is like you find, hire someone. It's like you hire someone to do the things that you aren't good at or you don't have the time to do. Like free up your, your, your good time. Like I'm good at the making. That's the best thing I'm good at. So I should, in theory, have people doing this other stuff for me. But when you're a small business, you can't afford that. Yep. So, I mean, that's the dream. In yeah, the end. that's that's the goal, right? You're the the to, scalability of to get to that point. Yeah, you gotta like find the. They say find your people and do that. So, 
Speaking of finding people, how can the listeners find you? Uh, Bunny Milkshake, how can they find your Instagram? What where, where are you at? Okay, so I'm on most of the things. I'm on Instagram. <laughs> most Bunny, of the things. I'm Bunny Milkshake Concoctions. It's underscore concoctions. Bunny Milkshake was taken already. Oh, I, those savages. I dragged my feet so long because I'm just, I'm not a tech savvy human. It's not my, not my thing. So um, I dragged and dragged and then finally it was gone when I wanted it. And I'm still grumbly grumbly at her but that's fine um because you can see i'm like oh you have a bunny named milkshake like oh i mean it fits it's fine son of a but then um i have a website bunnymilkshake.com and then i'm on facebook too i have a page there i don't do too much with the facebook page mostly the stuff that pops up there just comes right from instagram yeah so a couple i have a couple people that only look there but mostly it's instagram on my website yeah i'm, I'm kind of the same although statistically speaking um roi is facebook yeah, that, that's where the return on investment really is. Really? Yeah, like big time. Like huh. we're talking like I think it's like eighty nine percent return on value for advertisement on Facebook. I've something never like advertised that. on Facebook. I haven't either. I mean, I just do like I'll do all my you know quotes or so. I haven't done like a big push though. But yeah, yeah the uh, ROI on Facebook for it's pretty huh. pretty high I because try that one. they recent. In fact, I actually had a conversation. I did a. I think one of my previous episodes talked about Facebook algorithms okay. and how they kind of switched over from focusing on just the spam from, you know, news and stuff, right? Spamming to now having a lot of the stuff that you see is usually shared content from friends and families. Yeah. The reason they did that is because people are 16 times more likely to open up a link if it's shared by a friend or family than if it's shared by the brand. Right. So huh. Zuck's basically like, oh, I see people are more inner interactive with friend and family sharing. And so he's kind of prioritized those in the algorithm. So folks that are listening, please feel free to share <laughs> this, the bunny milkshake website or the shades of E website. So we can, you know, the organic, right. the organic growth, right? The organic. And I'll be at some sales too coming up. So I've got yeah, where, where are you, you going to be at? I'm going to at the night market. That's next weekend. Yes. I'll be there. I'm going to see oh, you. Okay. Yep. Good. We'll be there. Nice. And then on uh, the weekend after is crafty wonderland. Are you going to be there Friday or Saturday or both days? It's both days. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of all or nothing deal. Oh, perfect. So yeah, I'm not sure what day we'll probably, I'm thinking Saturday. We'll Saturday probably. is good. You got to get tickets now. That's their deal. You have to buy, you have to buy a time slotted ticket. The COVID thing. Oh shit. Well, good thing I talked to you. Yes. They're like $2 or something, but they're trying to limit the amount of people makes sense so that's um, good yeah so get a ticket and come i think the friday night's like the i think it's more money it's like the preview night okay so it's you know you get a drink it costs like probably 20 bucks to get in you get a free drink and you get access to all first dibs people get very into first dibs at these oh yeah i think it's interesting i was just going to support the community yeah to yeah. drink so you don't need first <laughs> well you can drink you can drink both days i think there you go i think maybe yeah. Winner. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I'll see you. I'll see you here later on this week from yeah, the folks at perfect. home. Thank you guys so much for listening. Please follow me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Please subscribe. Please check out the new website, the shades of E.com. I built it myself. Please tell me how you like it. Other than that, thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the shades of entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit the shades of E.com.